I am super excited to welcome Ollie Marchant on the podcast. We're just going to give him a second to join. Hello. Yes. Are you in the gym? I'm in there. Of course I'm in the gym. Mate. I will live well, and die in the gym, Tim. I didn't, I didn't know what you'd be wearing, so. Hey, <laughs> prepare. Just while you're, while you're, like, warming up. Hang on a minute. I need to come down a bit. I thought I'd just, like, you just tell me about yourself. <laughs> Mate, to be honest, you're lucky I've just put a t-shirt on. Uh, well, I did, I did think that might be a problem, on t shirted truth, truth be told, I've just had a little workout, so I'm a little bit sweaty uh, and a little bit, um, a bit more pumped than usual, mate, so. Right. Standard Sunday session for you, right? Exactly, mate. Sunday gun day. Right, let me just put some stuff in here uh, so people know what's going on. So we're gonna, uh, we've chatted a little bit before this, we'll give a bit of background. Um, I've called this First Principles and Real Truths of Training. That's what I want to talk about. Oh, nice. So, with at Ollie. Here we go. Let me tag you in. Right. March on. Done. Let me tag it. You know how it goes. Right. So, for, for some of you guys will already know Ollie. We've done a podcast with him before. Ollie and I go back a little bit. Um, Back to university days at the start of my SNC career and Ollie started his SNC career, to be fair. So, um, Ollie, tell the people a little bit about yourself and um, fluff it up a little bit. Give me the full beans, don't be humble, just uh, lay it on. Um, okay, so a little bit about myself. I mean, in modern day times, I um, am a gym owner. Um, so I own a gym called March On. Um, we have a bricks and mortar gym and then we also have an online business as well. So we coach people across the world, really. We're in multiple countries uh, and we do yeah online coaching online programming and then we have like i say a, a, a gym where we do small group personal training and, and team based team based training um rewind a few years i was a an athlete of sorts so i come from a rugby background athletics background um played professionally for a couple of years rewind a bit further back from that um being at university got a degree that's where i met tim so started my strength and conditioning journey under the supervision of tim as my mentor um well it must be 10, well, eight, eight, nine, 10, yeah, well, a long, well, yeah, a long time ago, so over a decade ago, I started my journey into being, I guess, a coach as well as, as well as an athlete, um, I realised that athlete careers are short-lived in, in some cases, I'd gone to university off the back of an injury, um, which had put me out, sidelined me for about 18 months, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've kind of whizzed through that, I guess I'm, a, right now, I'm a person of fitness, I am a coach, we also do coaches education through a company called the Professional Fitness Coach Association. Um, so my, my passion just lies within still being an athlete of sorts, still training very much myself. Coaching um, is where I really find my, my flow state. I love, I, love, I love coaching people. And now looking to sort of pass on information and support and guidance to new coaches coming into the industry, a bit like I guess you did with me 10 years ago that sort of led me to, to where I am today. So you know, I think, I think coaches need good supervision, good guidance, good mentorship when they first come into the industry. When I started 10 years ago uh, or 10, 12 years ago, it was very different back then. Um, as, I'm, you know, as I know you know, now there is uh, people coming into the industry as, as coaches from the top level and the bottom level. And it's, it's just this big melting pot of talent. Sometimes we just don't really know how to decide for our way and make the first steps towards what we're trying to, what we're trying to achieve. So I was very fortunate that I think I I got good guidance very early on, and I found I found my why quite early on, and it's led me to where I am today. Hopefully, that answers your question, mate. But we can dive into mate, more detail. For me you forgot to mention about like rugby sevens international caps. <laughs> I've done a humble. well. I've done a, I've done a load of podcasts over the last last few few months, and I, I I find myself continually talking about yeah my journey into it. And I don't know. I guess I it's just been a little bit humble. Yeah, so I, I represented my country, represented England at Rugby Sevens for a couple of years. Um, I've had multiple kind of stints as a professional athlete um, for, yeah. Different... Ending injury for a period of time with my, with my cruciate ligaments. That's when I went to university. And I knew that at that age, I still wanted, I still had something to give the, the, the competitive athlete world. Um, I still had the drive and the hunger and the passion. I'd got my degree, so I decided to give it another go. It um, took a little while to get back to the level where I could make rugby a full-time profession. Um, and I managed to do it for a couple of years, I say, with England Sevens. Got to about 26, 27 years old, and then I realised that I was holding on to a dream for the wrong reasons. Um, so I decided to, to, to turn, my, turn my back on rugby, and I've not really looked back since. Um, 
liked it. Really enjoy watching it. Don't, awesome. don't think I'll ever go back to playing it. That better? Cool. Right. So that is the, um, it's a bit of a dead lag on the, on the time of the thing. I think probably my Jack's probably watching something on, a, on, on a, uh, Amazon. So right, <laughs> that's the serious Ollie out of the way. So yeah. that's now we've got like, the background out. Now, first principles and truths of training. So as a man who's been in the industry, like, Ollie will come across as like, quite serious, very grounded, like focused. Discipline is one of your key principles and consistency, which anyone who follows him will know about. What you maybe don't always see is Ollie's lighter side. So I want to pull on some of that, Ollie. So what we're going to do is I've got a list of things, and these are real world examples, right? And I want you to debunk some fitness myths, the sorts of things that get like, put up on gym walls, t on t-shirts, maybe on the occasional mug. We're going to go through a few, and you can be as philosophical as you like, or just as dismissive as you like. If you dismiss yeah. all of them, it's going to be a short interview. That's what <laughs> all right, cool. So, we'll start off. I'm going, to, I'm going to ease you into it. So we'll start off. Common fitness myth. So we're going back to first principles. No pain, no gain. Go. Oh, well, I think we need to um, acknowledge that we need to get a little bit uncomfortable in order for us to adapt and grow and, and, and get stronger, get fitter, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, there's loads of cliches out there. So get comfortable being uncomfortable but we i think we understand the notion of progressively overloading the body where we can you know challenge it um get ourselves you know take ourselves that that, that next level so that we can we can adapt that's to that stimulus um and and recover and, and and move forward uh but i think the mentality of constantly driving that side of the, our system to you know constantly push and bang our head against a brick wall and not taking rest days and just not being aware of how hard we are training um, and just pinning all our hopes and dreams on each individual session rather than how that might fit together over a month or, or a period, a block of training over a year is a, a fool's mentality. Um, and I think we probably all realize that at some, some stage through our training journey when we, you know, we potentially get injured, get ill, and we get sidelined for a period of time. So what would you say to people that are like in pain regularly? If they're training with pain as a coach, how do you, how do you help them through that? Because loads of people get into it all the time. I've got back pain, I've got shoulder pain. And it's almost just like something they want to kind of wishing that one day is going to go away. But in my experience, unless you take some proactive action about it, pain just doesn't magically disappear unless you change what you're doing. Because you've got yourself into a situation causing pain in the first place, right? Yeah, completely. Um, I think just it comes down to people's priorities. I think most people's priorities are that they want to be you know, in as little as pain as possible and making as much progress with their physique goals, their movement goals, their strength goals, whatever it may be. And that, that's high on the list of priorities, but they're not really willing to prioritize the things they need to get, they need to do to be able to get, to get that result. And, and that becomes, you know, recovery, taking rest days, um, working with a, with a manual therapist, potentially going and seeing an osteopath every now and again. If, we, if we're constantly beating up the body through training and adding stress, how much are we how much time are we putting towards, you know, the mobility or the, the, the prep before the, before, before the training session or a, a nice cool down? Um, we know coming from the from a strength conditioning world, when we work with athletes, we're really trying to harp on about the prehabilitation, you know, a good cool down, good rec recovery protocols. But I think the modern day um, participant in fitness, just a recreational athlete, time is quite finite and they don't really see the importance of those bits. So to answer the question, we need to recognize what is, what is pain, just everyday pain, you know, coming from a, from a rugby background as, as, as we have, we're going to have aches and pains. Even just working a nine to five, you're going to have aches and pains. We're going to have asymmetries. We're going to have sides that are tighter than the other. And this is part and parcel of life. But if something's progressively getting more painful and then becomes a limiting factor to you know, your quality of life, first and foremost, you know, are you in daily pain, just moving around, getting out of bed first thing in the morning? Um, then that's not a pain we really want to be, just accepting. We need, to, we need to reach out to a specialist, uh, either read up on it, and then we need to take actionable, um, put things into action to try and, to try and improve that. Because training is, you know, it, it's, it's a journey and injuries are only going to stop that journey or limit it for a period of time. And like we said, the, the last thing any of us want to do is take a week or two weeks or three weeks off, off the gym. Um, and, and worse still, the last thing we want to do is then go into, you know, have surgeries and be taking painkillers and all these things that are, we're bringing into a system that aren't, aren't necessary, perhaps. Perfect. Right. I told you we could get philosophical. That was a bit more of a serious one because pain's no, no joking matter. Next one. Now, I'm interested in your take on this one because as a, you've got both, right? So now you have to decide. So education is important, but big biceps is importanter. <laughs> Which one? Oh. You've got a first degree in sports science. Yeah. You've got 
pair of biceps which are a bit smaller than mine, um, which is more important. Because we said that education is important, and I agree with that, I'm going to say big biceps are important to her because they're both still <laughs> important. Yeah. But over the last 10 years, I think my biceps has done more for me than my first class honours degree has. There you go. Mate, that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous statement to make in today's fitness industry because if loads of people got out, you're trying to start a business in education, you're just kind of hoping to go and get big biceps. What are you doing? One of the modules is on bicep curls, mate. Module one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we do that right before we do corrective workout. Corrective assessments is it's the second module. Big biceps is module one. You can't, you can't actually join the course unless you've got 16-inch biceps, mate. Yeah, because your, your, your... your t-shirt's got to fit well. Exactly. Right, let's, let's carry on this theme. This is something that I've been in danger of saying over the years, and as you get older, it may become or priorities change. Your body is your business card. How important? Oh, I, I think, as fickle, uh, again, without being too p philosophical, the fitness industry has become very much about aesthetics and visual. Um, and I think because... Because there are a lot of people with a really good voice and a really good message to portray and different platforms in which they're using it. Unfortunately, the fitness industry has become a very visual thing for the consumer. So um, usually if someone looks the part and they, they, yeah, they're well presented, they have a good physique, someone will, yeah, people will listen to those people more. Um, you know, I, know, I know just from experience, again, just from experience, growing my social media page when I first started, we, when I moved to, to LA um, after finishing rugby, Back then, it was about, if I can say this, it was about, you know, tits and abs and, 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 um, and ass. And, you know, the females were, were, were bearing a lot of skin. The males were bearing a lot of skin. And that was how people would, would generate their, their social media following. And I think but what, what, ha what you have to maintain is once people get through that bit and you've engaged them, there's got to be some substance there. So I think, yeah, I think your body is your business card. I think this in this day and age as a coach as a trainer you have to be able to walk the walk as well as talk the talk that doesn't mean that you need to be ripped with veins and biceps and abs and all that kind of stuff not at all you just need to <laughs> you just need don't, i'm i'm an extreme freak of, 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 of a person you just need to be um yeah you need to have you need to have experienced what you're you yeah, know essentially what you're what you're coaching yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things. Like, you, like you go through, like, go through S and C and stuff. And we we would always say to coaches coming through, like, if you don't love the gym, like, this isn't a career for you because you're going to have to go and try stuff because it, the the value that that places on your ability to coach an athlete because you know a little bit. You doesn't you don't have to be, like, you don't have to squat as much as they do or bench as much as they do, but you need to know what it's like to go under one RM because you're about to ask them to do a one RM. And I yeah. think that experience in the game of, of training yourself is massively important. And you can probably coach to a reasonable level without being mad on fitness and training. But those coaches that really excel, I think that's the understanding of going, I've got to do this myself. And whatever that might be, it might be that you're a flipping brilliant marathon runner. It doesn't have to be gym-based. Mm, um, completely. But yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, right, next one. This came from my yoga. Um, one of the coaches who works with is Yoga Jude. She often gets said that people say that, I'm not flexible enough to do yoga. <laughs> well, it's just like people say, I'm not, I'm going to get fit before I come and get you as my, before I use you as my personal trainer. Um, yeah. I think, <laughs> yeah. I, I think this comes down to uh, people's like sort of inhibitions or just scared to get started. I think people, you know, this, this barrier that people put up where they, they're just, yeah, they're scared to take the first step into the gym. You know, they, like I said, they want it. They want to get fit before they go and get a trainer or they want to get fit before they get fitter. Same, same with yoga. They're, they're scared to um, feel stupid, I guess, because, you know, I, 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 do, I do yoga every now and again. And there are some positions where I try and get into them. And I'm just, I remember actually when I did yoga consistently for a period of time, I used to go into this, this yoga studio and everyone was a good 20, 30, well, 10 to 15 years senior to me and be able to balance on their hat, you know, on their heads, do all these cra this crazy stuff. And I was, you know, I was terrible. And you do get quite self-conscious because you know, you're grunting, you're panting, you're, you're, you're falling over. Um, so I think it's just a case of somehow getting your message across that, you know, just, just get in here, just get started. It's our job to meet you where you're currently at and, and, um, and help you progress. There is no, you know, yeah. there's no minimum requirement of, of flexibility for yoga. It's just, let's get started. 
Yeah, I think it's that beginner's mentality, isn't it? People have got to embrace that fact of being a beginner is actually a massive positive thing because it's, it's there where the biggest changes are. Like, it's the law of diminishing returns. If you've been doing yoga for like 20 years, there's only a finite amount better at yoga you're going to get if you've been practicing consistently. Same with strength training. Getting an extra 1% on a 20-year uh, career of lifting is going to be flipping hard. But to go and get some gains at the beginning, just open yourself and don't feel like, I think it's people's fear of looking stupid or their own perception of self. Of like, I'm going to look silly if I can't do it. So mm. we get the same thing. People are like, I'm going to a workshop when I can do a handstand. And we're like, the point is to come to a workshop so we can teach you how to do a handstand. And then your process and enjoyment of your training will be way better because you're going away equipped to know a little bit more about how the process is going to fit together. But yeah, it, it links back to that very first question of, of, of um being uncomfortable i think with with any endeavor in life you just have to have that air of just vulnerability willing uh, willingly enter into that bit of discomfort and vulnerability and um and that's where that's where growth happens in anything you're trying to do even if you're trying to have a conversation on a on a subject you know, politics that you don't really understand go and speak to someone that actually understands more than you and just absorb um and maybe just yeah. you know sit sit and listen rather than trying to actually have the conversation which is a bit like yoga just sit and absorb what the coach is trying to say to you um, you know, get you, ease yourself into different positions, see how your body reacts to it and take that first step. Yeah, perfect. Right, next one. No carbs after six. <laughs> uh, the funny thing is, <laughs> if people, you know, people follow my stories, I don't tend to eat much carbs after six, but it's a, in, in, in the world of body composition, energy balance, um, just trying to manipulate, you know, your, your weight or your reduced body fat, whatever it may be. There is no, there's no real evidence, you know, to suggest that meal, meal timing or, or macronutrient timing is, is that, in, that important when it comes to energy balance per se. If we're looking at different nuances around circadian rhythms, potentially quality of sleep, um, you know, I impact on on yeah impact more on, on physiology of the body at that sort of time then there may be a, a deeper argument but for, for, for most people uh, when it comes comes to their nutrition most people are just trying to look look better um, naked you know feel better about themselves uh, and i think that the the answer here would be find a routine first and foremost with your nutrition that fits you best you know eat eat, eat food try and get in in tune with um hunger signals so when you are actually hungry I would prioritize carbohydrate more around training just because that's probably a, a better use of, of, of that macronutrient, you know, pre and, pre and post. Um, it becomes more important maybe later on in the day if we're going to get up early and, and do some sort of physical endeavor where we, we, might, we might have fasted through the evening, uh, through, through the night, obviously, and then we're, we're, the, we're going to try and train early in the morning. It might be more important then. Um, but if, if we're looking at the context of weight manipulation, that sort of body composition, no time is, is large, largely irrelevant. Nice. And what do you think about, like, there's been a big sort of rise in, in, uh, you know, in fitness. We've kind of been through a, a phase of lots of more complex or uh, let's say dietary approaches, nutrition approaches over the years. They've kind of come in fads and they've moved on and some of them have stuck. And then it all kind of like simmered down. Everyone went calorie deficit. But then I think that for me personally, we're missing a point about this because everyone's like looking at that in a fairly simplistic context. And you and I have talked about complexity before and the human body being a complex system for me it's not just as simple as a calorie deficit because the quality of what you're eating is still massively important and if we're eating rubbish then that's you can't well, as long as my calories and create a deficit then i'm fine thoughts on that yeah and you make you make a brilliant point i think i think the fitness uh, the nutrition industry or, uh, over the last sort of 18 months has really tried to meet the, cons meet the consumer where they're at which is everywhere all the research and everything is in into just like obesity and how we can how we can solve this obesity pandemic um or crisis and you know, how we can help people lose weight and so so all of the research and then all this evidence-based information that's coming out is, is geared towards that um and it's sort of moved away from how we maybe view nutrition as more performance-based you know and how can we actually optimize our health and our performance and there are some practitioners who are now trying to marry the two up they're actually you know, across great information our nutritionist that uh, march on is, is very much aligned with that um but you know you're talking to someone in myself that spent you know post rugby the best part of four years monitoring tracking weighing on you know my fitness power i was a my fitness power whiz you know understanding calories it was not necessarily from a, a calorie deficit point of view but just to understand energy balance the laws of therm thermodynamics macronutrients what worked what didn't having now not done any of that for the best part of two three no, more than that three three years I've had more success with my training, both strength, physique, performance, health, 
um, mind, just mindset around nutrition as well. From getting rid of all of that and just getting getting in tune with, hey, uh, what, what are my hunger signals like? How am I feeling? What did that food? How did I react to that particular food? Um, creating routine. I think the, the nutrition industry is, is the one that's sort of the fastest moving right now. And as as new things come in and new things get researched and studied, everything sort of changes. Um, fad diets or the different diets that have come into, come into it, they all are, tr- are built around one thing to try and sell it to someone. And that sort of like sexy clickbait title. Um, but really what it, you know, what it comes down to is just understanding macronutri- you know, macronutrients, how best, uh, how to use them, what each of them may do when you ingest them into the body. Um, and that deeper level of understanding is really important. And understanding of calories from an energy balance standpoint is important. But once you've got that information, it's then how do you move on? Because we can't spend our life you know, try and, if, if we're going to do a calorie deficit and the goal here is fat loss, let's get into a, ded, a dedicated um, period of, of a calorie deficit. Let's lose that, lose that weight and then let's move on. I think the problem is for 12 months of the year, people sort of like are, try, are continually trying to diet and that there's that diet culture because they never really spend a dedicated time actually doing it. But let's, let's, let's spend six weeks, eight weeks, whatever it may be, diet down and then let's, let's move on to the next bit, whether it's, you know, build some strength build in, you know, build back some calories so that we can actually perform better. I think what's interesting when you be point right about it's about it comes down to education for me. Like we we've, we've got so much information available to us and what happens if people are going to go and stiff it all the time because like we've tried to put out more detailed information on, on Instagram before on social or education kind of content. And there's some formats that, that that work with that and there's some formats that don't work as well. So it's hard to get across like, like Twitter's a great example, right? I try to get a get more bit more engaged in Twitter. But I was going through and I was watching it and I was like, all of this stuff lacks context because it's, it's a 280 characters or whatever it is you can do. Someone's making a throwaway statement and you want to go back and reply, but you can't because you don't understand. You actually, if you understand that, that there is context behind every statement that people are making, then it's really difficult to jump in on that. And I think that's what people are getting, just lots of different sources of information without actually understanding the first principles, as you said, underneath it. And I think if people just, if they're serious about the training, they should educate themselves about that as a research area, as a hobby. It's something you become invested in rather than something that you just do to get what you deem as being out and just grabbing stuff because people just get confused and it's they jump around all over the place. This is something you spoke about before of like just train like program hopping from one to another to another and then all of a sudden you just you don't really know where you should be or what you should be doing. Yeah, I think anyone that's had any success in in, in the fitness industry, they've they've bought into something. You know, they've bought bought into and they've actually followed it through for for a period of time. Um, and I would say to the, whoever's you know, consuming or taking this information from all these different places, most of the people you're probably following have all the all information, like the, the, the successful brands or businesses you know, have all that information for you. So just, just follow them and listen to what they're saying. It's fine to consume other people's content. You know, if I come to the School of Calisthenics to learn how to, to, to handstand and, and to improve my calisthenics, you know, and then, and then you, you obviously offer, offer yoga and you know, I know if I tapped into your mind about nutrition, I'd get everything I need to know from you. From you. So if I was, you know, if I was doing that, I would just buy into the school of calisthenics and everything that, that, that comes with it. Because you look at, you know, with that, you look at you and Jacko, not only are you ninjas when it comes to calisthenics, but you both have very aspirational physiques. And that, come, that comes from not only calisthenics, not only nutrition, but then also how you view lifestyle and, you know, in general, your recovery, your sleep, and all these things that actually fit together and what people need to take um, take into consideration when they're trying to get to i need to look better feel better about myself look better naked whatever it may be you know it's it's the whole package it's the whole school of calisthenics package it's the whole whoever it is that that you that you're that you're that you're following so there's no point coming to you guys for you know i'll come to you guys to look at my handstand and i'm going to go to someone else to try and get the nutrition because then we're constantly having our attention pulled all over the place and i think that's where the problem the problem lies and then once we've got the information it's actually applying it because that's the hard bit. That's the bit, again, where we have to become vulnerable, uncomfortable, and actually apply it and put some effort into it. And without the effort, without the effort, there's no learning. And I think that's people's problem. We don't, want, we don't really want to learn anymore in life. We kind of do, I'm getting philosophical now, but we go to school, we go, uni, we go university, we get, you know, we, 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 t- we do whatever learning we need to do to take that next rung in the ladder of what's important, maybe career, you know, career progression, whatever it may be. But other than that, we don't want to learn. When it comes to, a training program and how best to, to carry out that training program when it comes to nutrition and, you know, and how, you know, how to formulate a nutrition protocol when it comes to how best to sleep and recover, we don't want to learn any of that stuff. We just want to be spoon fed it. You tell me what to do. Yeah. I'll do it. And, and we move on. But 
more effort requires more learning, requires better results. And I think that's where people need to get to. Without making training and nutrition take over your life, because not everyone is a, you know, is a, is a fitness professional, but if it is that important to you and you've spent the last three, four, five years yo-yo dieting, not getting to where you're trying to get, spending loads of money and effort on things and sort of not getting anywhere, maybe the, you know, it's time to, to change your mindset and how you engage in it. And do you think people's like um, concept and time around this sort of stuff has got a little bit warped? Because like our experience of it, we'll, we'll tell people that, okay, they, they come to us and like, I want to do handstand push-ups, freestanding, perfect. I'm like, okay, you need to go and get stronger. I want to do a muscle up. Yeah, go and get stronger. And I think a lot of people will look at that and it's like, oh, two, three weeks, two, three weeks of strength work. And I'm like, man, like from where you're at now, and it's either the same principle apply for myself, I'm thinking three months of strength work. I mean, you've just gone and done a 200 kilo deadlift. Like that, that, the building up towards that has been a significant period of time in terms of I've got to focus on strength, nailing the basics and being consistent, not for, not for one training cycle of three or four weeks, but for four or five maybe training cycles to, to build that up over time. I think it's the same thing for across, is that consistent across nutrition, training, everything that we're talking about? Yeah, uh, yeah, 100%. Because there is always it's like doing your first pull up, right? So you do your first pull up and then you, you get your chin above the bar. So like, I've, I've done a pull up. It's like, okay, you did a pull up. If the, if the context of the pull up was go from straight arms to bent arms with your chin above the bar. Okay. Now let's change the Now let's change the parameters here. We'll move the goalpost a little bit further forward. So now can we hollow body? Can we get, you know, from a complete dead hang to not just the chin above the bar, but can we get our chest to the bar? And now we're building, we're building strength, but we change what the pull up is. So it's the, same, it's the same with nutrition, it's the same with sleep, whatever it may be. There's all, it's probably always a next step to take. We can always improve our morning routine. We can always improve our wind down routine. We can always improve our training program. And I think that's the beauty of fitness um, or just life is that it's so pure and you can always, always get better at it. But take the reference of the 200 kilogram deadlift. You know, I've been training from, I'm 32 this year. I've been training the best part of probably 16, 15, 16 years. I was making great progress coming off the back of rugby. I was big, I was strong. And then I, you know, I went into some endurance-based sport and then I maybe take, took three years to go backwards in terms of my strength. So it's been a four-year journey to get to a 200-kilogram deadlift. Um, and I've not gone near a one-rep max on a deadlift. Yeah, I'll probably maybe go, go near it once a year. So the goal was to, to, was to, to improve my 1RM. But I actually have, you know, go near that one RM you know, one, one, once a year because there's so much groundwork to put in to try and get there. You know, and it's not just the deadlift, it's the accessory work and improving my posterior chain, improving my trunk stability so that you know, I can actually take the volume through my back without, because without, you know, I've had like, multiple, multiple injuries. So um, again, success leaves clues. You know, and if you look at you know, my experiences, your experiences, how much skin in the game we've put into this. It's deliberate practice every, you know, every day or four, five, six times a week, whatever it may be, year on year. Um, and we, we, know, we, we accept people can't put that amount of time in. But if we, if we, if we just sort of like scale it back a little bit, because you're not trying to necessarily look and act like I, you know, myself or you, but if we're trying to aspire to get somewhere near that, put the same sort of principles in place. Nice. Right, let's, uh, this, is a, this is a genuine question or quote that came through from one of our other coaches that I asked around this. And this is a client that he works with. I'm not, I can't obviously mention names for this. <laughs> just follow along as I explain how this goes on and, and then just give me like off the top first response. So the rationale is, if I train upper body, then I'm going to get heavier, which means my legs are going to work harder and therefore I don't need to train legs. <laughs> that's, some, that's some real science, right? <laughs> that's quite a clever way to look at it um something you'll well, adopt do you think or not I, th I think i've been adopting that for my calf for the last <laughs> calf for the last 16 years and let me it's tell worked, you does it? let me, it's not worked yeah so <laughs> let's let's uh, brush that one aside it doesn't work although right, although that, 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 that said to that said that said <laughs> I, and i'm a firm i'm a firm believer in this i need to be a little bit careful how i say this but i I think there is a correlation between kids who are quite heavy at a young age and significant calf development. Oh, okay. Uh, like from, and again, I've, I've not studied it and I've not, I'm, I'm yeah, pulling yeah. this out. I'm pulling this out of the, um, out of the air. But when I look at some of the people that I know have strong calf development, they are, they've, they've often been potentially not, I'm not saying over, but, but, but thick set. At a young, yeah. at a young age, uh, you know, and then, 
Maybe, maybe, we've, we've, maybe. We've, we've, we've dismissed it, but maybe there's some some, uh, some logic. Yeah, I mean, that's that's. I guess that's kind of my excuse for having small calves. Um, and then, like, yeah. like, like I say, over the last 16 years, having done a lot of upper body training and these little pins had to carry it around, they've not grown. <laughs> but, like, calves is one of those things, isn't it? Like, a big calf will often be seen on people who are not that fast. Like, if you want yeah. to look at basketball players, they've not got huge calves, but they'll be the bounciest in the game. Um, yeah. What's Leo like? Is Leo, is, Leo, is Leo a heavy, like, well-set young man, or is he a... It's hard to tell. It's, it's hard to tell, really, because you know, of late we haven't really seen him compared to other other kids. Because obviously the current the current current environment, so I've yeah. not really got any reference point to to work it out. Um, yeah, I, I think he's I think he's very very average to be honest. I mean, genet genetically, um, my family aren't particularly big people, um, both 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 high and you know physically. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see how he well, progresses. We'll the good thing about this is we can do like we can do a longitudinal study, can't we? Because we can watch it. Like Jack, my little boy, is, I think he's fairly like he's got a, his, 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 his grandfather on the South African side is like a well, like short, stocky, kind of quite well set. And I think there's a little bit of Jack of, of him in Jack. So we, we'll, we'll, in ten years' time, we'll we'll take a circumference measurement of the uh, of the gastroc. Have a look and see how he's doing. Right, let's be, I've got a couple more, and then I want to talk about your training a little bit. Um, lifting weights makes women bulky. Nonsense. How, how, how many times have we heard that, though? Yeah, and, and I, can see, I can see why, you know, why, people, why, why females might draw the, 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 um, the parallels with that. Um, because I guess for, 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 the, for the sort of females that I think say that, when they first looked at the picture of someone that lifts, lifts, lifts weights in, in, in print media or on, on, on social media, that sort of stuff, it, they, do look, they, they do look potentially bulky. Um, and lifting weights was usually reserved for bodybuilders and people that wanted to, to build muscle and, and be bulky. But then when you dive in deeper into the, into the sort of terminology and the words in which they use, you know, I want, to, I want to be stronger, I want to be more defined, I want to be more toned. Um, we can only do that if we actually stimulate a muscle. So you're going to need to lift some weights. Um, but getting bulky, we've addressed the nutrition piece, is largely down to pounding the weights, but also eating too much food. Yeah. But CrossFit hasn't done uh, that dogma many favours, has it? If you look at the female, high-end female competitors, but I think where people forget around that one is that it's the, the, the form of the exercise, the volume that's doing, the intensity that they're doing, the, the frequency that they're doing are way, way higher than most people who are worried about bulking up a little bit by going to the gym. It, and you, you exactly hit the nail on the head there. If you think about the amount of muscular contractions that those athletes put out daily, monthly, yearly, it's obscene. You know, the, those, those sort of athletes are training three, four, five, you know, five times a day. And I think the, 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 the difficulty here in, in terms of like trying to relate this to, to us is if you take someone like a Matt Fraser, and I think if you take someone like a Usain Bolt, right, they are on, on the same level when it comes to like how good they are. We would never, if, I, if I'm a runner or a sprinter, I would never even like compare my physique or my running to Usain Bolt because we just, like he, he's obscene. But because I'm a person of, because people are people of fitness, well, well, oh, Matt Fraser, he, he lifts weights or he does the same sort of exercise as I do. So I, I can, you know, I must, I'm, if I just do a bit more, I might look like that. Like no way, you will never, ever, ever, <laughs> ever get to that sort of level. Um, and it's the same with the females. Like you, you see a female CrossFit athlete and they are, you know, 10x what I am as an athlete. So they are a million miles away for what the what the everyday, you know, two to three times a week, four times a week female gym goer will will, will ever achieve. Um, so yeah, don't worry about that. Yeah. Lift some weights. Right. Last one, and then while I do this one, then I've got a few questions for you just about training in general, your training, that sort of thing. If anybody who's watching has got any sort of like uh, any miss or they've got they're wearing a t-shirt that says something or this up on their wall of their gym that there's a little bit confused about like you can go away and ask um or go go ahead and ask questions type them into the chat box and we'll see if anybody else has got any cliches uh, or fitness dogma that we need to just kind of address and deal with so my last one um and i've got <laughs> i've got a flip a coin on this one um this one made me laugh more so i'm going to go with it sweat is your fat crying is that a physiological <laughs> thing or not <laughs> I've seen it in a textbook. <laughs> uh, again, it's, um, I think that's a, it's a load of nonsense, but I, I, do, I do like it. I mean, that's the thing with all the, now, because fitness apparel has become so popular, 
um, particularly like sort of athleisure wear and fe females love it, whether they're going to the gym or not. All these cool slogans have sort of come into it. And it just makes lightheartedness of, of, of you know, of, of, of fitness and, and training and that sort of stuff. So I, I do appreciate all that stuff, but you just need to be a little bit careful and read between the lines of what you're actually, um, what you're reading. The other one that was, you know, I, was, I was tossing up between was that and sweat is weakness leaving the body. Leaving that's, the body. That's... <laughs> it's, it's brilliant, isn't it? I think, yeah. <laughs> As long as, as long as someone's not using that as like their real motivational piece and actually, you know, trying to be too serious about it. Um, yeah. It's all... all right, we'll let a few questions come in and then we've got some more sort of fire. We'll get another 10 minutes or so and then we'll, we'll maybe just get a few people asking if, uh, see what questions are coming through. But so for, when I look at your training, Ollie, like you've got a very, um, it looks like you've got a very complete approach. You're training your, your fitness, um, your business and your brand is built around train everything so you're ready for anything. What's missing from your fitness like, or from your training? Because it's very, very difficult for people to do all the things all the time consistently. And, and even I think that's where some people will find it a bit overwhelming, that there's all this stuff I'm supposed to do. How do you get to a point where you can do more? And then also what's, what's missing from, from your training as somebody who's got a pretty complete setup? Yeah, so I think, um, first thing, again, going back to, I guess, the CrossFit athletes or, or, or my experience or how I came into industry, I'm very lucky that I have multiple muscular contractions and training phases that I've been through and programs that I've been, that I've you know, committed to over the years that I have a very big base. Um, so I've, you know, I've moved weights and done, you know, different um, modalities of fitness, whyether it's, you know, sprint based work, plyometrics, endurance based work, lifting weights, powerlifting exercises, that sort of stuff. I've done loads of it over the years. So I have a really big base. So it means I can be a little bit more generalized now that I'm a little bit older and a little bit further down my training journey. Um, also, because I'm, the reason why I engage in fitness is, is for more just being a bit more of a generalist right now, because I'm not a competitive athlete anymore. If I was, then I would need to be a little bit more specific um, around whatever the sport it was that I was trying to go into, potentially something like a, like a, fit, a fitness event where I'd come unstuck then, you know, and what, what's missing is potentially um, better gymnastics um, I've got, I've got good body weight skills when it comes to like body weight strength, but like gymnastics, I'm not that great at, uh, and Olympic lifting because I've never, uh, although I can coach it and I've, I've, you know, we, we used to do it when I, when we, when we worked in strength conditioning, um, and I can do, I can do it to a, a, an acceptable level. Um, I would probably fall apart in, in some, in competition. And I, I don't really have any, I don't really have the top end numbers because the juice is just, isn't worth the squeeze for me in terms of how much time I need to put into it. Um, yeah. So does that answer the questions or was there, was there a third yeah, part? Yeah. What, yeah what, well, what's, what's lacking? Is there anything that you wish you could do more of that you think would actually make a difference? Because you're right. Like I don't do Olympic lifting very often. I occasionally just drop in and do some cleans or something just to keep the, the movement pattern fresh. But for a number of different reasons that we don't, I won't bore people with now, it's not something which is a major part of my training program. But there's always kind of things where you're like, I should probably do more of that. Like, so, the, but these things which are, are potentially of more value to where you're at and moving yourself forward. Is there anything you go, I wish I could have more time or I probably sometimes get distracted by other work and that takes me away from something else, which I know is of importance. Um, not, uh, yeah. I, I, no, there is, there probably, there probably is something here and it's probably more around this, the, the, if my goal was really to build strength, which it has been, to get that 200 kilo deadlift, and it's been a four-year four year journey, it didn't need to take that long. Probably, you know, so so mm. I'd probably get, because I'm a bit of a generalist and I like different bits and pieces, and I probably see someone going, you know, this morning I've run a 10K, um, you know, first, thing, first thing this morning. But then tomorrow I've got heavy front squats. So, again, like it, if I really wanted to take my front squat and take my, my, my strength training that seriously, I probably shouldn't run a 10K this morning. But for, for one reason or another, again, won't bore people, things I saw about, you know, in London that was going on yesterday and just time just to sort of compute mm. what's going on with the world and, and go and just go and do something that is a little bit different and that it doesn't really take much. Um, I don't need to be too aware of what I'm doing in that time and, and, and I can just go and be, be mindful in, in, another way, in another way. I went, went and did a run. So I probably, because I'm such a big consumer of fitness I, and, and, and just sort of this generalist, I probably end up just doing a little bit too much sometimes. Um, I, I can facilitate yeah. it and I can recover from it and I can still have good quality sessions. But it, for that reason, I probably limit myself being able to get to these milestones in terms of my strength that, that little bit sooner.
cool. All right, let's go. There's a few questions just come in. A uh, real simple one while I go through and pick some other ones. Does more reps equal more definition? Uh, so if we look at sort of hypertrophy as being one element of trying to build muscle, um, because definition is probably going to come from having a, a bigger, more prominent muscle and then having less fat around that muscle. So more reps, if we're, if we're talking concepts from going, concept, concept from going from maybe like the, the, the sort of one to six rep range, moving towards more hypertrophy. So six, eights, twelves, fifteens, potentially even, even a little bit higher than that when we go into metabolic pump work. That combined with trying to reduce body fat, which is going to come from a calorie, you know, a, a calorie deficit for, yeah. for, for people who are a little, a little bit further down their journey. Or if you're very new to it, you can actually reduce body fat and gain some muscle as a novice lifter. Um, then you're going to look more defined and, and more toned. Um, and of course, the more we can raise our metabolic rate through exercise, which is probably going to come from more repetitions because we're working harder. That, again, combined with nutrition will help you look more defined. It's a better use of training time if the goal is to, to define muscle. Yeah, and, and touch on that point about complexity as well. It's not necessarily just one factor. There's going to be a number of different things that you have to bring into play. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, would you say that body type, e.g. endomorph, comes into account when trying to build muscle? Do you know what? I, I, back when I was sort of like really on the ground with what was the latest research and evidence and stuff like that, there's, I was really into sort of math types and that sort of stuff. I don't know where it's currently at now. Um, I think genetics, you know, we're predisposed to probably hold muscle and, 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 and our frame be, be built in different ways. But really, when it comes to building muscle, um, the thing that probably holds a lot of people back is the fact that they're not engaging in a, prog in a progressive training program. So they're not trying to progressively overload their body and, and, and lift weights seriously enough. And two, again, they're not addressing the nutrition and the recovery side of things in order to stimulate growth. Um, yeah. I think if people just had, just dived into a little bit of detail about what they're actually consuming consistently, not on the days in which they're, you know, um, consciously trying to consume more food, but what about the days when, you know, just the, the everyday thing. So on average, how much are we actually consuming? Are we hitting adequate protein? Because we know that's going to be very important for muscle growth. Are we engaging in a, in a progressive strength training program? We know that's very, very important for trying to build muscle. Um, and are we, tot in totality, are we consuming enough food? Nice. I think with that one, is if people can get a little bit hung up sometimes on what's my body type, and it's important that you've got a recognition of it, but ultimately the, the, the benefit or the, the value is in finding out how you're going to respond to training. And that goes back to your previous point about try lots of different types of training, be a student of your own training and see what works, mm -hmm. track it, monitor it, take a periodized approach to it, and then you're going to have a recipe. And there's some interesting stuff. We, we did a podcast recently about hypertrophy and, and some of the research that Brad Schoenfeld has done around just volume. And often, often they're saying that like low responders to hypertrophy work just need more volume in the training program. It's been shown it works in cardiovascular training or, or like endurance type training. Um, so if, you, if you're doing like this idea of three sets of 10, it will work for somebody, but it might not work for everybody. So you might want to go and try six sets of 10 and see what happens. But you won't know until you know, until you, you go and try it. And then you get into the thing around well, rest periods, intensity, volumes, all that sort of stuff. But I think it's just become a student of your own craft, isn't it, really? Yeah, and I think if we look at the, the, the best people in the industry at building muscle, i.e. bodybuilders, they'll always have like a, you know, their training log. They'll always you know, they'll have their training program and then they'll monitor how many sets and reps did they do for chest over that week. And how can we then, you know, it's progressive overload is something that I think, think people get a little bit caught up on. It's just trying to look at trying to get more, you know, more work into the system. So by, by, by tracking these things and not just going to the gym, like we said, and go, putting all our hopes and dreams in that one training session, today I'm just going to bang out a bit of chest. You know, and the next day it's mm. going to be whatever it is. And then, you know, it's actually following through with the training program, tracking and monitoring and being a student of your own body and your own training and then learning and then progressing. Some things will work, some things don't, and things take time. Yeah. Right, a couple more and then we'll sign off. We've got the guys at Red Light Rising who have been uh, very kind to sponsor our podcast recently. They're also sponsoring the podcast live event today. So massive shout out to Red Light Rising. Uh, you can go and find those guys on social if you just type in at Red Light Rising. You're going to see what they're all about, the benefits of Red Light Therapy. Um, they say, hi, Ollie, do you focus on time and attention during your programming, especially to stimulate growth? Time and attention. Again, so if we, if we are looking, I, I've kind of moved away from worrying too much about tempos and things like that in my, in my own training. Um, but for people who do come to us that are looking to, to build move, movement competency first and foremost, because position, positional work and tempos help people just get a little bit more kinesthetic awareness of how their body, where their body is in, is in space and how they're moving. And they're also, you know, more time under tension 
is a way to progressively overload the body rather than chucking on more weight and things onto the bar. So it's just a training tool um, that is definitely, is definitely important, particularly when we're trying to go on Tim, jump in. No, no, go on, you can you go? Yeah, as I say, particularly when someone's a bit, a bit newer into, into, into training, particularly when someone's trying to build to, some hypertrophy and, and some muscle um, growth into, uh, into the system, uh, it's, 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 it's important. Cool. Right, last couple of quick fire ones then. Um, any standout books you'd recommend for fitness or nutrition education? Nutrition stuff, I think starting with um, precision nutrition, I think I think's really good. So um, John Berardi stuff, that's I think that's sort of like a good entry level um, nutrition course. Uh, and then the Mac nutrition stuff, I think I think it's brilliant. It's it's something that our nutritionist that March on, she's just um, graduated through M MNU. I think that's that's really good. Again, they're sort of at the forefront of of um, evidence based research for nutrition. So I think that's brilliant. Um, and then. I think John, John Bradley stuff's brilliant. He's got a book out called Game Changers at the moment. That's brilliant. Um, a lot of the work I'm doing, as you know, well, re like reading around is, is, the, is, the, is the breathing stuff. You've got Patrick on, I think, a little bit later today. Is, is he on later? Or yeah, has he already been on? Two o'clock. I think two o'clock. Yeah. So, again, I, I've come under fire a little bit of late of, of people saying, oh, where's the evidence and where's the studies and where's the research in, in, into this? But Oxygen, Oxygen Advantage, I think, is a brilliant book. I think breathing is a really low hanging fruit that is, is it's worth exploring more than anything else. Like even if you don't fully buy into it, it's worth, you know, for, for someone like me, who's always looking for that 1% or, or 5% or that, that next thing that I can maybe improve my performance or even just how my, my, the way I operate in everyday life um, breathing something yeah. that I've never really, I hadn't really looked into until maybe two years ago. And over the last sort of eight months, I've really dialed into um, and it's making, you know, make, making a, a big change in my life. So, I would yeah, give it a go. The important, one of the things that I, I think is relevant around that is that everyone's quick to kind of go show me the research, but you've also got to, and that, that's important, don't get me wrong, but you've also got to match that with the fact that we're doing stuff in the gym and fitness moves forward, training moves forward because people are testing stuff. And the research is actually slow to get to a point where it's I've enough sort of noise around it for the academics and the researchers to go and actually study it and create a, um, a study to publish it. Like we, we had that in Paralympic sport all the time. We were doing stuff that we had no evidence base because we had to, because there was no, it was too slow. The people, it doesn't fit the, the traditional model of doing a scientific paper because you've not got a big enough population size, all that sort of stuff. It doesn't mean you can't do it, but it just means that there's sometimes a lag between actually what you've been doing. Like phone rolling was one. Like everyone's phone rolling. And then now there's loads of studies you can go and read about it, but it was being done to, with some decent effect for, for a long time. So it was frustrating when people like, show me evidence. I'm like, well, if we, if we only have a base on evidence, we're never moving forwards. You've got to have some people that are out there pushing the field a little bit. Yeah, and the evidence is always going to be based. Yeah, it's, it's always going to be based off you know a particular bias as well. So there would be one study that shows one thing, and then the other person's bias will be able to find a study that shows the other. And like you said, right now, particularly in breathing, I think sample size is a bit of a limitation. I think the fact that it's it's uncomfortable and it's it's unconventional and it's hard for people to do. Um, that's why you know people don't don't take it on. But it's it's been very beneficial in what I've been doing recently. All right, guys, I'm so sorry to everybody else who asked questions, but we're running out of time because we are going to get um, Tony Riddle, natural lifestyle, is hitting up on two, at 2 o'clock. I need to get ready, change the scenery, get ready to go and do some ground-based movement. So thank you to everybody who's asked questions. Sorry we didn't get to answer them all. I'm sure Oli gets peppered with DMs, but if you want to drop him a question or follow anything through to us afterwards, then feel free to do that. Um, mate, as always, we could have chatted for probably a good few hours, and post-lockdown, we're doing that. I'm going to come down and see the gym and, I have a little bit of a, a tune back out. And I need to hit you about something else. So I'm going to send you a message later on, probably today or tomorrow, just an idea, something that's floating around. Perfect, mate. Thanks so much for having me on today. How, oh, mate, before you go, so this might have crashed my audio last time, but what I wanted to do was walk out music for everybody. So I've picked a track for everybody that I'm interviewing today, specifically, right? So I've got one for you. But I didn't want to play at the beginning because it might have bodged the audio because I had a few problems before. So I'm going to play you your music now and just just to sign you off and you can see if you like it you ready yeah great tune <laughs> love it mate actually i've got one last question before i go at what point do you get to where you can refer to yourself in fitness in the third person <laughs> how have you managed to do that are you the rock I, I don't know. I always I do stupid I do stupid things and they seem to just catch on. Um, well, I think I put yeah. it down to you've got two good initials that sound good together. O M. It's kind of rhythmical. Yeah. It's got a rhyme to it. Well, I actually, I, like, F W works so well. 
I now I actually call other me. people. Yeah, I call other people that have two initials that fit well together that as well. Um, I call I call one oh. guy just TK MB. Yeah, it's just kind of worked. Anyway, you you keep doing your thing, mate. I love it. Cheers, Tim. Thank you for joining us. We'll catch See you soon. guys. See you All soon, right, guys. Cheers, take See care. you later. Bye bye. Thank you.